Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manuela Mobutu, and today I'm going to tell you about my research proposal entitled Cigarettes in Mozambique, Status, Restoration, and How Meadows Influence Biodiversity. This study is funded by Cigarettes Protect Project from Wyomsa and UNEP, and is supervised by Prof. Janine Adams from Nelson Mandela University, Prof. Johan Hollander from World Maritime University, Prof. Salomon Bandeira and Dr. Malinu Mubai from Eduardo Mangiani University. Well, this study is exciting me because it combines the social and ecological elements to start seagrass. It's a study in seagrass restoration, but also consider human dimension. It values coastal communities, perceptions, and knowledge about socio-ecological uh, relations. Well, I will begin the presentation with the background of the study, rationale, overarching aim, research question, materials and methods, work plan, and then conclude with thesis outline. Let me quickly move to the presentation of my proposal. In Mozambique, the coastline extends over approximately 2,700 kilometers, and it's characterized by extensive fringing coral reefs in rock limestone in north, several mangrove forests in center, and sandy dunes in south. 6% of country's population is living in coastal area, and much of the country's economic activities, such as ports, tourism, and fishing, mining, and energy are located in coastal zone. Seagrass are marine geosperms widely distributed in both tropical and temperate coastal waters, creating one of the most productive aquatic ecosystems on Earth. In the region, Mozambique is one of the countries supporting the highest diversity of seagrasses, with 13 species found along the entire coast, with extensive beds occurring in sand and limestone areas, and they are estimated to cover a total surface of 43,900 hectares. Among other ecosystem services, many seagrass species produce an extensive underground network of roots and rhizome, which stabilize sediment and reduce coastal erosion. And their leaves can also slow movement of water which reduces wave energy and offers further protection against coastal erosion and storm surge. Seagrass also enhances water quality by stabilizing heavy metals, pollutants, and excess nutrients. Globally, it holds twice as much carbon dioxide as rainforests and accounts for more than 10% of ocean's total carbon storage annually, making it a tool in the fight against climate change. In Mozambique, seagrass also support a large variety of associated fauna, including population of dugongs and sea turtle, both of which feed on seagrasses. These habitats also act as a nursery grounds for commercial and recreational valued fishery species. Some fish species utilize seagrass meadows in various stages of the life cycle. Further, commercial important invertebrates also reside in seagrass habitats. In Maputo Bay, for example, 72% of people that collect invertebrates do it in seagrass meadows. The higher, higher diversity found on seagrass meadows promotes them as a tourism attraction and a significant source of income for many coastal economies along Mozambique coast. Although they are important ecosystem service, cigarettes are still overlooked and globally decline 7% of their cover annually due to climate-related and anthropogenic pressure that include erosion, storms, cyclones, increase in water temperature, coastal development, turbidity, 
dragging activity, destructive fisheries practice, both proper among others. The result of this decline has been a change in coastal productivity, reduction in critical fisheries habitat, and increased erosion. These two studies of Amonma Boot and Bandeira and Gel clearly show the change in seagrass cover around Iamban and Maputo Bays. In Iamban Bay, in 1992, seagrass covered an area of 12,000 hectares, and after 21 years, in 2013, seagrass covered an area of 6,000 hectares. In Maputo Bay, seagrass covered in 1991 an area of 532 hectares, and in 2003, the area of seagrass reduced to 73 hectares. At sedimentation following cyclone Elaine and clam pollution were pointed out as the major causes of this reduction. Restoration has become an integral part of coastal management as a result of seagrass habitat loss. Historically, restoration is well recognized in terrestrial and freshwater ecosystem. Seagrass restoration has been conducted for nearly 70 years since the middle of the last century, and the vast majority of seagrass projects have been conducted in USA, Europe, and Asia. In 2019, the United Nations declared 2021 to 2030 the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration with the purpose of recognizing the need to massively accelerate global restoration of degraded ecosystem to fight the climate heating crisis, enhance food security, provide clean water and protect biodiversity on the planet. We know that in Mozambique, coastal communities are among the highest at risk of natural disaster. We also know that seagrass habitats are in decline. Yet, little is known about risk literacy and the role of seagrass in coastal protection and food security. Yet, studies in seagrass restoration do not exist. So we expect with this study to improve community awareness on the role of seagrass in coastal areas, to provide new knowledge on methods of tropic seagrass restoration, and improve the knowledge on the role of seagrass restoration in maintaining biodiversity. The overarching aim is to test transplanting methods and infer the possibility to recover seagrass habitat and restore its ecosystem function in southern Mozambique. And to achieve this goal, following research questions were raised. Question one, what is the perception of coastal communities on socio-ecological values of seagrass in southern Mozambique? Question two, what is the status and extent of seagrass in Mozambique? Question three, which method is best for seagrass transplanting? Question four, do transplanted seagrass have effects on biodiversity? Now we are going to move on to materials and methods. To give answer to question one, a survey was done in four communities of Maputo and Yemen Bays using questionnaires. Data were collected in three phases, nominal group technique discussion, household survey, and key informant checklist. Nominal group technique comprise discussion with beachfront residents, beach users, fishers, and elder people with mixed gender consideration in each group. The participants were selected to give an overview of the area's characteristics and issues faced by the communities caused by coastal erosion. 
household survey comprised a door-to-door -door survey with Fisher's household. Every resident Fisher who had more than 20 years of fishing experience in the community had the livelihood of being selected in the sample. The questions were asked verbally in local language and some of them supported by visual materials such as cigarette speech image and answers written directly on the questionnaire file. Key informant checklist comprised interviews with village leaders, elders, fisheries officers, beach management unit leaders, investors, tour guides, and experienced officials. Participants for this first were selected as the most likely to have long-term knowledge regarding detailed information on demographic characteristics of the area, livelihoods, and historical trends of shoreline change. Fulfilled work done after the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, the survey was done in accordance with the safety measures and government re regulation regarding social distancing. As such, inquiries and participants wearing masks, a reasonable distance of 1.5 meters kept between participants and inquiries, and hand sanitization before and after each survey. Well, I have some preliminary results regarding household survey, where measure of respondents were made with 77% of participants. And educational status among the respondents was relatively low, with only 12% of respondents having studied above the primary school level. When asked about sociological function of seagrass, the participants pointed out support fisheries production, had natural biot to coastal waters, place for social interaction, and shoreline protection has the main social function of seagrass. And regarding cause of seagrass degradation, they perceive to be mainly caused by climate change and destructive fishing practices. When asked about causes of shoreline change, high tides and degradation of marine ecosystems were mentioned as the major causes and agriculture and tourism were the main activities affected by the shoreline erosion. Regarding potential measures for shoreline protection, build artificial infrastructure, ecosystem restoration, as well as avoid construction in beachfront were proposed and when asked about advantage of local seagrass restoration, they mentioned increased of fisheries, promotion of tourism, and coastal protect protection as the advantage of seagrass restoration. Well, we are moving on to question two. And to answer this question, two mapping methods are being applied. The first method is macro scale mapping. The procedure is based in obtaining maps from Google Health and in production of database with CGRES occurrence GPS points for existing ground truthing data to locate CGRES beds along the coastline. Data will be analyzed in KGS software, produce map of presence and trends of CGRES beds. The second method is micro-scale mapping, which is focused in obtaining detailed information regarding conservation status of seagrass meadows. This is being performed at Nyaka Island in Maputo Bay once quarterly in a year to cover seasonal variation. 
The survey consists in making transects in areas of one kilometer square within each seagrass beds using a drone and collect imagery over the area. Also performing ground truthing to access seagrass zonation patterns, species composition, percentage cover, leaf layer, and substrate type. So far, six flights were done, but we intend to, uh, to do more flights. And uh, around 2,000 images were collected. The image is being processed in Pix4D Mapper application to produce orto mosaicus. Well, moving on to question three. Three different transplanting methods are being tested for Zostera capensis species. Plug method, shoot method, and staple method. Plug method consists in use tubes with 7.5 diameters to strike the plants with the sediment and rhizomes intact and placed in received areas. In shoot method, plants are dug with a small shovel and the sediment is shaken off and the plants are made into planting units and placed in receiving areas. In staple method, Plants are attached to the staple by inserting rhizome and roots portion of the plant under the bridge of the staple and placed in receiving areas. The experiments are being performed in 15 plots, five plots for each method at Inyaka Island. The transplanting is based on collecting seagrass from health beds, mature plants with rhizomes in buckets and directly replanted into the graded area identified previously. For each plot, 80 units of plugs, shoots or staples are transplanted separately of another in 0.4 meter intervals in columns and rows and survival rate seagrass percentage cover, shoot density, canopy A, sediment properties will be monitoring for two years. This slide with very preliminary results show that plug and shoot methods are good candidates for transplanting zoster capensis with above 16% of survival units in six months. Well, moving on to question four, and to give answer to this question, I'm going to select three locations with seagrass beds, three locations without seagrass, as well as location with transplanted seagrass in the same areas chosen for question two and question three at Inyaka Island to contrast the effects of the presence and absence of seagrass. Data collection will be performed quarterly in two years period at each location with and without seagrass. At least three transects perpendicular to the shore will be performed. While in transplanted seagrass, three quadrants will be deployed randomly. A number of biological variables will be assessed such as seagrass percentage cover, shoot density, canopy A, sediment properties. And along the transects, sample will be taken from 25 centimeter square frames at each 10 meters interval to access biodiversity and abundance of macrobentos. Biodiversity index will be calculated and similarities of abundance and distribution among the location will also be calculated. Well, this is the work plan showing when each activity is taking place. For research question one, data collection has been completed and I'm currently interpreting the results and writing. 
and uh, the expectation is to finish with the manuscript by February 2021. Uh, for research question two, I'm collecting data for one year since last month, and the writing for the manuscript is scheduled to be completed in March 2022. Data collection for research question three started in April this year and will be done for two years. And the interpretation of results and writing are expected to, complete, to be completed by December 2022. Field work for research question four will start earlier next year and will be performed for two years. And the completion of the manuscript is scheduled to be uh, on February 2023. Uh, finally, uh, completion of thesis writing and submission, uh, submission is uh, scheduled to April 2023. This is the thesis outline, proposing general introduction on chapter one, a paper on perception of coastal communities on sociological values of seagrass in southern Mozambique on chapter two, paper on status assessment of seagrass in Mozambique on chapter three, paper on assessing method for restoration of Zostera Capens in Maputo Bay on chapter four, paper on the effects of seagrass transplanting on biodiversity in chapter five, and finally, final discussion and conclusion in chapter six. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation and uh, let me say that uh, the results presented here are very pre preliminary and I'm still analyzing my data and I'm also excited to see what is coming up from them. Thank you.